Um, so if you want to get your Bible, we're going to turn to Genesis. Um, what I really feel like the Lord has for us this morning um, is a message about how to live in his presence. Because how many of you know that there's only true rest in God's presence. He's the one. He's perfect peace, the Bible says. And so I want to show you, we're going to kind of go all throughout the Bible today and show you kind of just different, really practical ways to live in God's presence. But first, I want to encourage you guys with a story of something that happened a few uh, Friday nights ago at youth. Like Pastor Bob said, I am the youth pastor, which means I get the amazing privilege yeah. of discipling, pastoring some of the young people in this church. Is anyone in here is a parent of a young person at this church? I just want to thank you um, for raising your kids so well. We have some amazing youth, and it is such a privilege for me to see them uh, Friday night after Friday night just really going after the Lord, wanting all of his heart. And that's so encouraging for me just to even see that and be a part of a culture that goes after God like that. And I remember... It was just a couple of Friday nights ago, my friend Aaron um, was speaking, and, and we, we kind of have a team that leads the youth ministry, and so Aaron uh, has this huge grace on his life just to see people um, get healed by Jesus. Any, any of you ever read this book and seen when Jesus heals people? Anyone see that? We, uh, we're kind of crazy. Uh, we believe that uh, this book is not just for the past, but it's for today. So we like to pray for healing like Jesus did in this book. And so, so he speaks and he um, has people raise their hand, some students raise their hand um, who have trouble believing that God actually wants to use them um, to heal people. How many of you guys would respond to that altar God? I'd, ra I'd raise my hand. I'd respond. You know, so they, so they raise their hands and then Aaron's says, okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to do crazy. If you feel like, God, like you have trouble believing that God wants to use you, I'm going to use you to be the ministry team right now and to pray for the sick, for any sick or injured students in the room. So we start to call out things that we feel like God's, because some of you guys think this is crazy, but this is just Friday night. Okay, so we're, we start to call out some of the things that we feel like God's touching in the room, like headaches, knee injuries, um, some of the things that I did earlier, like depression, and we begin to call it out. Students begin to raise their hands, and then it's such a beautiful sight to see a bunch of high schoolers and junior highers just go throughout the room, lay their hands on people, and just pray. Like, I think Jesus would have prayed full of compassion and love for God just to touch people. And it was the most um, crazy thing because students just start getting healed. We start to ask them, all right, who's feeling breakthrough? If you have a headache, whose headache is gone? And people just start to raise their hands all across the room and, and people are just getting healed. And then and my favorite thing is this, and so we actually have, um, we have high schoolers from other youth groups who come and visit our youth group because they hear about some of the things that God's doing. So one guy from this one youth group brings his friend with all of these sports injuries. So he has, I mean, his neck's whacked out, his, his legs, his arms, his back. He, I mean, he's just in pain from sports. And, and we call out a lot of the things that he's dealing with. And he gets completely healed. No more pain in his body, Okay. <laughs> which is amazing. And so he actually comes forward and gives his testimony. I love it. He, his testimony is this. I walked in the room thinking that God uh, would never heal me, but I have no more pain in my body right now. Isn't that good? Come on. So, so I love it. I think we did a count just by students' own self-profession saying, I got healed. I think we saw 22 or 23 students get supernaturally healed. And I think that's an incredible thing. Because I really think just Church Rock of Roseville, uh, the, Jesus, when Jesus came, he said that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And now that Jesus who brought the kingdom of heaven lives inside of us. And we actually have the ability to be touching points from heaven on earth, wherever we go. And the things that are in heaven, perfect peace, perfect joy, perfect healing, actually are available to us because the king of heaven lives inside of us wherever we go. You don't have to come to a church service to receive a touch from God. You get to go be the touch of God to people in the world because he lives inside of you. And so one of the things that I truly believe, if, if heaven is perfect peace and perfect love and perfect everything, if there's things out of whack in our life, because how many of you guys know that you do not live in perfect peace all the time? That's just reality. That's sin. That's, that's what's real. Um, but I believe that if there's those things in your life, which there is, that there's something out of joint, because God actually desires for you to live in perfect peace, for you to live in his presence. So are, you, are we in Genesis 1? Are we there? Um, does anyone even bring their Bibles anymore? On a Friday night, it's like... I mean, it's iPhones and iPads. So, I mean, I like this service with the, with the real Bibles. Um, so get it, get it out, Genesis chapter 1. We're just going to 
we're just going to kind of look at how God designs the world. So God, God creates heavens, he creates, the, uh, he creates the earth, he creates land, he creates sea, and he creates all of these things in Genesis chapter 1, the whole earth. And then right then at the climax of creation, he goes and he puts man right in the middle of it. You guys familiar with that when God creates man in Genesis chapter 1? But something that's really interesting, um, which they teach me at seminary, which is a great place to learn stuff, um, if any of you want to go there. So and, and they, te- they teach that in other creation accounts from other religions during, during this time, when the, when the Bible was written, um, in other like Middle Eastern, ancient Near Eastern accounts, um, the Bible actually doesn't look as much like a creation account as it looks, Genesis 1, looks like other religions writing about their gods creating a temple, okay? And so when you read kind of these other accounts that are are written during this time, the gods would create these temples, these magnificent things on earth, and then right in the middle of the temple, they'd put a statue, an image of themselves to represent their presence filling the temple, And when you look at our beautiful creation account, which we believe is the inspired word of God, unlike these other creation accounts, we actually see God creating the earth like a temple and then putting man right in the middle of it, men and and women, designed to be representatives of his presence all over the earth. Isn't that cool? That's a cool thing. So God puts humanity right in the middle to live in his presence, the actual presence of God, and then represent his presence. He tells them to go fill the earth um, all over the nations of the world. He says, represent uh, my presence all over, which is an amazing thing. But then something sad happens in Genesis chapter 3, if you want to flip over there. And we're going to read Genesis 3, verses 8 through 9. It says, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Everyone say, where are you? And there's this crisis of presence that happens. When Adam and Eve eat of the fruit, um, it probably wasn't an apple, if you're familiar with that, and I'm kind of thankful it wasn't an apple, because then we'd all, um, how many of you would be guilty in this room if the apple was the sinful fruit? So um, I'm glad it's not an apple, but they eat some sort of fruit, whether it's a pomegranate or a banana, whatever it is, and then what happens is they sin, they disobey God, and then what happens is there's this crisis of presence, and they're not in the presence of the Lord anymore as they were designed to live. Because how many of you guys know that God's holy, and so he actually can't be with sin because he's perfect, he's holy. And so when Adam and Eve disobey God, there's this thing that happens where they get separated from God's presence, and then God comes to them, and his cry is, where are you? And what I love is this. How many of you guys got timeouts when you were a kid? You were raised in a house with with timeouts. I I remember... um, I remember one time, um, I, I was perfect growing up, so I didn't really get, I, okay, one time I got a timeout that I remember, and um, I remember it was like my brother and I were arguing in the car on the way home, and we're just fighting, and, and my parents are like, when we get home, you guys are grounded, you have to go to your room, and so I go to my room, and I just, I just remember that, but there's this thing, and I'm not trying to make a commentary on parenting or anything, I don't have kids, but there's this thing that happens when we grow up um, with timeouts, and we, we think that when we mess up, there's a withdrawal of presence that is supposed to happen. Where when I got in trouble, there was a withdrawal where my mom and dad took their presence away from me in my room. And some of us have kind of grown up with this mindset, when I mess up, I'm not worthy of being around people anymore. Does that make sense? But what we see in Genesis chapter 3 is Adam and Eve mess up and God doesn't run away from them, he runs to them. Do you know that we serve a God that in the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of our mess, in the middle of your worst moment, he's running to you saying, where are you? Come back to me. And that's the God that we serve. And then what God does is because there, there is ultimately the consequences for sin, we don't ignore that. Um, they, they, do have to, they do have to leave the garden. Um, but what God does is God sets out on a grand restoration mission to get his presence back to his people. 
And that's ultimately what the story of the Bible is about, as we're going to see, is God, and that's actually a slide, I think, if you want to say that, is God, God sets out on this grand restoration mission to get his presence, because you guys remember that, we're designed to be in God's presence, sin enters in, there's a wall of separation that happens, and then God's whole mission is to get that wall gone and get his presence back, to be with his people again. And then he chooses this guy in Genesis 12, he chooses a guy named Abraham and says, hey, Abraham, I'm going to choose you. You're going to bless all the nations. And so there's the idea of blessing that Abraham is going to be carry God's presence all over the earth. And then he picks, in Exodus, he picks a guy named Moses. Everyone say Moses. And he shows up to Moses in Exodus 3. Do you guys like the Bible? I think it's a good story because we're, we're doing Bible stories this morning, okay? So he chooses Moses in Exodus chapter 3 and says, I'm the God of your father, Abraham. And immediately Moses remembers the stories of his father, Abraham, that God showed up to you, that God called out and said, I'm going to use you to bless the nations, to fill the earth with my presence. And Moses realizes, man, I'm called to do the same thing. And so what God ultimately does is he chooses Moses and, he, and Moses leads the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. He leads them into the desert. And then what happens is in Exodus chapter 19, there's this amazing passage. And this is after the Israelites leave Egypt and they're in the desert, they're wandering. And we're gonna read Exodus chapter 19 together, verses 16 to 20. Do you have those as a slide? Awesome. So it says this, on the morning of the third Day. Does that sound familiar, by the way, on the morning of the third day? Okay. Um, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. I'm going to verse 18. Now Mount Sinai, and this is the mountain that they're talking about, was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. Let's look at that, verse 20. The Lord came down. Everyone say that. The Lord came down. Just a normal Sunday morning at the rock, right? Thunder, lightning, loud trumpet blast. This is amazing, okay? They're in the desert. There's thunder. There's lightning. And God's presence shows up in a supernatural way. And what I love about this is, is, is it's all about God showing up to Israel. It's all about God coming to Israel, coming to his people. Because a lot of times we think that we have to do all of the right things and then God comes but what the book of Exodus is about is about God coming to his people in the middle of their slavery, choosing them, calling them out. And then right here in the desert, he gives them this firework show of his presence. And then he tells them, hey, I chose you. You're special to me. I love you. I've chosen you. And it's amazing. And what happens after this is he gives them the Ten Commandments. Anyone ever heard of the Ten Commandments before? And I think a lot of times what we think is we think it's in the reverse order. Okay, follow me on this. We think if we obey the Ten Commandments or whatever commandments are in our life, whatever the Lord says, then the presence of God will be in our life. It's the reverse. God showed up first. God shows up with his presence, and then he gives them the Ten Commandments as a way to maintain the presence of God in their midst. And that's what the law is designed to do. And if you read the book of Exodus, most of those laws, which you talk about in church, are actually, in the book of Exodus itself, are about how to maintain the presence of God in the midst of the people of Israel, how to build the tabernacle, which was designed to host God's presence. And we see, the, and the book of Exodus ends with God's presence, again, coming down in glory. The book of Exodus is about the presence of God. And I think what happens is we start to think of, we can think of Christianity like it's a list of things to do like it's a certain, and it, it is to some extent, but like a certain set of beliefs. Some of us in here might think that Christianity is a certain political system or way to believe. Christianity at its core is about a God who overcame every obstacle to be with his people who overcame every wall to get with you, who you, in your worst moment, there was a God who came with thunder and lightning and showed up with his presence and said, hey, I love you. 
And even more than that, and this is crazy, some of you might have never thought about this, I don't just love you, I like you. I like to be with you. Because that's what he's doing. He just wants to be with his people in Israel. He wants to lead them and he wants to guide them. Christianity is about it's a relationship and then everything we do in Christianity is a response to that relationship. Everything we do is a response. And we see Moses really lives this in Exodus chapter 33. It says that uh, he was a friend of God. I think we have that, Exodus 33 verse 11. It said that the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. So I want to ask us a question this morning. You can just ponder this in your own head. If you took away this is, this is intense. If you took away everything that you did for the Lord, every church service you attend, every um, you know, Bible passage you read or every Bible reading, every action, everything you do for the Lord until all that was left was just your conversation with him in your head, your friendship with him, what would be left? And that's a question that I really like to ask myself because we can get so caught up in our doings for the Lord that we forget about just being with him and just responding to his love. And that's when our church becomes this distortion if it's about us doing the right thing and not just receiving his love. Because I, th- I think a lot of times what happens when we start to ask ourselves that question, if I took away everything I did for the Lord and just kept just that conversation between me and him, and I'm not even talking about set aside like, my quiet time or my Bible reading time. I'm talking about the ongoing conversation where you're just talking to the Lord. Um, if, if that was all that was left, what would be left? I think there's this thing that can come in of like almost this condemnation of, man, I don't do that. How many of you guys felt that, by the way? Just, just that condemnation, like, man, I don't do that enough. Um, and and I, th- I think where that comes from is honestly not hearing God's love for you and not hearing the, what the voice of the Father is speaking. Because I talk to students all the time. So, so I, I, talk, I talk to students, and a lot of them, um, and you guys might relate to this, they have, they have all these issues with like identity, not knowing who they are. Um, or or the, a lot of them have like just, just this performance thing. Like they have to do all these things to make God happy. They think God's mad at them. Anyone can relate to that in the room, feeling like, you know, maybe God's mad at you, or he gets upset when you sin, all this stuff. And I found out, and this is crazy, talking to all these students, I realized that the core issue in each one of these students' lives with all these issues that they're dealing with, the core issue was, I'm going to say, I know this is crazy, I'm going to say all of the time was that they didn't have a dad in their life growing up, all the students that deal with this, or they didn't have a dad who was emotionally connected to them, listening to their emotions, caring about their needs. And so they grew up without the voice of a father speaking over them, speaking life over them. And as a result, now that they're in high school, they're starting to feel like they have to do all these things to earn people's approval. And so I think for us is we've got to get back as a church to hearing what the Father is saying for us, saying to us, and recreating, because that's my, that's my advice to them, is I never tell them, oh, well, read this passage of the Bible. I just say, hey, you know what? You just got to, li- you got to fix. You were designed for 18 years growing up to get the voice of your earthly dad speaking life over you, telling you that you're loved and that you're accepted and that you're valuable. And what you've got to do now is you've got to get the voice of your heavenly father into your life to, to create a narrative for your life that goes against the narrative of your childhood. And because I know for, for me, what I started to do probably three or four years ago is I just started to sit down in the morning and I, I'd read the Bible and then I'd get a piece of paper in front of me and I'd just listen to that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. How many of you guys have ever just felt like just that still, kind of small voice? I just listen to that still, small voice and I just say, Father, what do you want to speak to me this morning? I just write out what I feel like he's saying. And I remember for a couple weeks, all I would say was, Ryan, I love you and I'm proud of you. And at first I was like, oh, that's, that's so sweet, Lord. And then, and after about three weeks, I would sit down, same thing, Ryan, I love you, I'm proud of you. Four weeks, Ryan, I love you. And after a while, how many of you guys would think this? I'm like, this is just me. This isn't the Lord. Like, it's the same thing every day. Like, that's not God. But I kept doing it. And then probably about, it's, I'm really slow. My skull's pretty thick. Probably about three or four months into it, suddenly I had this novel thought what if this is the Lord? (laughs) What if he's trying to tell me something that he really does love me and really is proud of me? 
And I'll tell you, four years later, every morning, I sit down, Ryan, I love you. I'm so proud of you. And what I've seen that do in my life is it shifted my focus. Where I used to go into all these self-condemning thoughts of how I wasn't worthy, I wasn't able. And all of a sudden, I'm more sure of who I am. I know that I have a dad in heaven who's proud of me, and my life's on this direction towards him. And I feel like God wants to release that into us for this 2016 year of we have a God who's proud of us, and he likes us. He loves us. We continue on in Exodus 33 and verse 12. Um, Moses has this conversation with the Lord. Because what happens is uh, Moses goes up on the mountain. He meets with God. And then uh, the Israelites do this crazy thing. And they melt all this gold together to create a golden cow and begin to worship it. Okay, right after he shows up with the thunder and lightning, which we could think is crazy. Um, they're worshiping a cow. But how many of you guys have ever um, maybe, maybe worshipped the, the steak that you eat at a restaurant? I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but seriously, though, they go from the presence of the Lord to worshiping this other thing, which we have a tendency to be like, oh, those stupid Israelites. But really, how many of us go from the place of prayer to yelling at our kids, to go from the place of prayer to looking at pornography on the computer, to going from the place of prayer to going from church and all these things and so quickly changing our allegiance. That's what the Israelites do. And in the old covenant, which is what they're in, God tells them, says, hey, I can't continue forward with you on your mission to the promised land. You have to go without me. And Moses knows. He says, we can't do this without the presence of the Lord. And so he prays. Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name. I have found favor. So Moses, so, so Moses says, Lord, you can't send us without you. And then he reminds him of what he said. He says, you said that we found favor in your sight. You said that you love us. You said that you like us. I think some of us just need to look at the Lord and say that, God, you said that you love me. I remember that. You said that you like me, you enjoy me. I remember that. And Moses says that to the Lord. And the Lord sa- and Moses says, now, now just come with us. Consider too that this nation is your people. And in verse 14, God says, everyone say, God says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Now, something's interesting here is, is if you look at this in the Hebrew, um, the, word, the word your, your presence, or um, my presence will go with you, that word you, everyone say you, and then I will give you rest, is just talking just to Moses. We can't really see it in English unless we were from the South. Is anyone from the South in here and say, say you all? Is that even how you say it? I don't even know. I'm, I'm from California. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, so God's just saying to you, Moses, I will give you. He's not saying y'all here, okay? He's saying you, Moses. And Moses understands. He's like, yes, I, I, God, I want your presence but the people need your presence too. And so he asks again in verse 15, and he says, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. And then in verse 16, he reminds the Lord again, we found favor in your sight. You love us. You chose us. You like us. And if your presence doesn't go with us, how are we going to be distinct? How are we going to fulfill our call to bless the nations and carry the presence of God all over the earth? I think some of us in here just need a kind of a resolute cry to say, I won't do it without the presence of the Lord. Yeah. So how many of us go throughout our day, wake up in the morning, do the things God, God's asked us to do, being parents, you know, even for me, being a youth pastor, without ever seeking the presence of the Lord to go with us. And you know, I really think, I really think it's as easy as waking up in the morning as just waking up saying, God, Remember what you said. You love me. You like me. And then receiving that narrative of what the Father's speaking over us. I think we can learn something from Moses. He was desperate for God's presence. He wouldn't just do what God asked him to do. He needed God to be with him to go forward. He needed the relationship. He wasn't about to just do. He wanted to be who he was with God. And then what I love, this is amazing, is he gets what he asks for but he still goes forward. He, and he says in verse 18, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. He says, uh, Moses says, please show me your glory. Do you get this? This is amazing. Because he gets what he asks for, but still he presses in for more of God's presence. God, we got your presence, but now show me your glory. 
And I think some of us, we can get used to what God did in the past because Moses just saw God show up with thunder and lightning and trumpets. How many of you would be satisfied if you had an encounter like that? You saw smoke come down. Like, I'm good. I'll go to heaven. Like, that is good. But Moses sees that, but he's like, still, God, I want more of your presence. I love that. Show me your glory. And I think so many times we can get used to what God did that we just get comfortable. And it's like we have this experience with God and then we kind of just plateau. And I think it shows up in a lot of areas of life, especially if we see God not show up how we thought he would. Or if we're praying for healing, God doesn't heal, or we're praying for deliverance or finances or whatever it is, and God doesn't show up, we let our previous experience with God determine our future experience with God. And here's my core conviction, church, is that I don't want to let anything but this determine my experience with God. And that's why youth on Friday nights, I mean, we pray for healing all the time. We don't always see healing, but we're not going to let our natural experience determine our future. We're going to let this determine our future. And I'm going to go after this. And I think that's what Moses demonstrates to us. He's saying, God, I want to go after all that you have. And I think it really looks like Paul prays in Ephesians 3. He says this in verse 19, Ephesians 3, 19. Um, and I think that should be a slide. It says, and he prays for the Ephesian church. He says that you would know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And there's this idea that there's this fullness that God wants us to have. And I love that he starts with love, that you may know the love of Christ. That surpass- we can't even comprehend how much the Father loves us. It surpasses knowledge. He loves us so much. He's not mad at us. He likes us. Even when we sin, he's still there. He loves us. That you may know that, even though you can't, and that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Like Moses' prayer, show me your glory. God, I want more. I, um, we, just a couple weeks ago, we I took a group of guys. Um, Maya was there. It was fun. So we went up. We take, thank you guys. By the way, you guys know we, we do groceries. We deliver groceries a lot to the neighborhood out there. So thank any of you who've given to that. Um, so we, we, we've been doing uh, kind of the apartments a lot. And we decided that what we wanted to do, some of you guys might think this is crazy, but we had some extra bags of groceries. And we're like, what if we just prayed and asked the Lord what houses to go to? And then just knocked on the door and said, hey, here's some groceries. So we did it. So I had this group of guys and we're in my car and we're like, hey, we just, we're just going to ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what houses do you want to touch and bless today? And so we kind of get pictures of houses in our head. Um, and one of us gets, a, gets just this picture of this pink house, okay? And so, so we say, hey, we're going to look for a pink house. And so I drive my car into the neighborhood. And what do you know? The first thing on the left is a pink house, okay? So we park, we pull over, and it is so... Um, it's so scary because it's like, not, oh, not, you know, that we bless the neighborhood. It's scary because of this, because um, uh, there's a gate that you, that's like a tall gate that you have to go through to kind of get to the door, to knock on the door. And so I'm not sure, and I'm leading these guys. So I'm like, I got to look like I know what I'm doing, but it, it looks like her back door. And so I'm like, we can't go knock on her back door. She'll like shoot us maybe, you know, like, so I'm like, okay, we got to, we got we to do, we do something. And, and so, so I look around, we don't see a front door. And I'm like, all right, we're just going to do this. So we open the gate and walk in and there's stuff all over the yard. And I'm like, this is her backyard. <laughs> and so we knock on the door and she opens the door and she just looks scared. Like she's like standing way back. It's just a, a single lady. She stands back. She's like, what do you want? <laughs> and I, instead of saying hi and assuring her, I'm like, is this your front door or your back door? <laughs> She's terrified. Because, she, I mean, we're like young guys. We could, you know, who knows what we're there for, you know? And, 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 and she just stands back and she's like, it's, it's my front door. I'm like, hey, we have some free groceries for you. She's like, excuse me? And I just explain, I'm like, hey, you know, we're from the church right down there. We're from the Rock of Rosal and we have some free groceries. And she won't take them until she sees them. So I'm like, here, see, there's toilet paper, paper towels. And she was so blessed. She just took the food. She was super grateful. Um, and it was, it was just awesome. And that's the end of the story. She took the food. She was blessed. Um, nothing scary happened. The reason I tell that story is because 
God, I truly believe God led us to her. And, and I kind of told the guys who were with me after that, as I was like, you see how she was really closed off? And then by the end, she was open once we demonstrated that. And because here's what we did. Some of you might disagree with this. We didn't offer to pray for her or anything because um, she was really closed off at the beginning. And we believe God doesn't force anything. He doesn't force us to like him. And so, so I just kind of noticed, like, hey, this might not be the best time to offer prayer. So we just gave her the food. We'll probably go back in a few weeks, give her more food. And then after a few weeks, give her more food and until her pantry's full, and then we'll say, hey, you know, we just want to bless you, we want to love you, can we pray for you, you know? And then, bam, sideswipe, just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> our heart really is, it's to love her. And, and so I truly believe that God, God divinely ordained this relationship with this woman by showing us a picture of her house in her head. And, you know, I truly think that some of these, this is what God wants to unleash in our lives, is this radical life of living in the presence of the Holy Spirit, letting him guide your day. And that's what it looks like to follow the Holy Spirit, to obey him. And that's what the fullness of God looks like. Because here's what happened. We're going to finish the story. This is the good news. Turn to your neighbor and say, this is the good news. So when sin blocked the presence of God, God runs to them and says, where are you? But then they have to leave the presence. And then God shows up and he gives them a law in Exodus to keep the presence in their midst. But then something happens that's amazing. And it's God comes as a man named Jesus. And then Jesus lives this incredible life modeling what it looks like to live in the presence of the Lord, to pray, to see healings, to see miracles, to make disciples. And then he dies on the cross, takes all of your sin, all of my sin, all the shame, all the guilt, everything you've done in the past, everything you did, this week, everything you're going to do in the future. He bears it on his body. He dies. All of your junk is buried in the ground. He rises from the dead, leaving your sin in the ground. And then this is why he does it. He dies to get rid of your sin so that on the day of Pentecost, there's nothing blocking us from him. He sends the Holy Spirit, God himself, to live in us and nothing can ever separate us from God again. Say, that's good news. Because maybe you've never thought about it that way before, but what if the goal of everything was that we were designed to live in God's presence, carry his presence all over the earth, and then Jesus dies for us, creating a way where now God himself, the very presence of God, lives within you if you've said yes to Jesus, and now there's nothing that could ever separate you from God's presence again. No sin, not death, not height, nor depth, nor angels, nor demons, nor anything can separate us from the love of God because he lives in you. I think what can happen is we can start to believe these lies of, oh, I messed up, I yelled, I feel shame for what I did, and it's like something separating you. But the truth is, is God really lives in you. And then Jesus, in John chapter 15, he gives us an incredible picture of what it looks like to live in the presence of God. He's giving his disciples instructions in John chapter 15 of what's going to happen after he leaves. And I just want to, we're just going to end kind of with this passage right here of some instructions that Jesus gives his disciples of how to live in him um, once he's gone. We're actually going to start in verse 9. If you want to turn, you can turn your Bibles to John chapter 15, verse 9. So he says this, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. That's amazing. Can we just say that? That's amazing. It's a congregation. Say, say, just say, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. And then in verse 10, he tells us how to do it. He says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. How many, does that sound like Exodus where God shows up with his presence, there's a presence, and then he gives them things to do to maintain his presence. It's the same pattern right here. God shows up, he says, abide in me, Jesus, the presence of God on earth. And then he says, if you keep my commandments, you'll stay in my presence. It's very similar. Um, and he says, you'll abide in my love just as I've kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. Everyone say the word abide. abide. And so this word in Greek, you guys ready to speak Greek? Won't this be fun? We're gonna speak Greek together. So, are you ready? Anyone scared, intimidated? It's really easy. So say, me no. Me no. And turn to your neighbor and say, me no. me no. All right, if you were married, that was a good thing to say because the word um, says, stay here, <laughs> don't leave me, okay? It means to remain, to continue to be present, to wait to endure. And so if you look at all the places in, in the New Testament where this word is used, it has this sense of not leaving, 
So when God says, abide in my love, he's saying, hey, don't leave my love. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Don't leave that reality. Because I think a lot of us think that the love of the Father for us is such an elementary doctrine. That once we learn, yeah, God loves me, and then, we try, and then we do it. We try and do all of these things when God's saying, hey, the key actually is just staying there. And I really think it looks like just waking up in the morning, God, you love me. You're for me. Getting that narrative of God as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. And it's actually a commandment to not forget it. Because I think sometimes we can even feel guilty. Like, I'm thinking too much about how much God loves me. Don't leave his love. Don't do it. You'll get off track. Because he even says, this is how you do it. You keep my commandments. And you know, what's the great commandment? Someone yell it out. What's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So this is the key. This is the key. These are Jesus' steps. He says, number one, you receive my love as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. And the key to staying in that place is then to love God back and love other people. But it all started with God's love coming down on you, with Jesus Christ dying for you, proving once and for all, giving his whole life for you, and then saying, don't leave my love. So if someone could come up to the keys, because what's amazing, or the guitar, I don't know, whatever Brett wants to do, keys or guitar, or drums, we could get a little, okay, just kidding. <laughs> that would kill the mood, I think. Because um, <clears throat> the amazing thing is the cry in the garden of where are you is answered on the day of Pentecost with an I'm never going to leave you ever again. God's cry, where are you, is answered at Pentecost with an I'm never going to leave you again. And God himself lives inside of you, loves you. And now this amazing thing happens where, I mean, why don't you just put your hands on your stomach, right? Now? Just put your hands on your stomach. And this is kind of weird to think about, but I, I do this at youth all the time because it's just fun. Students like, you know, touching things. They're crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so just put your hands on your stomach. Underneath your fingertips, is the God, as the Holy Spirit, but is the God who created the universe, who birthed planets into existence, who created heavens and earth, lives inside of you under your fingertips right now. The God who raised Jesus from the dead is actually alive on the inside of you. And what the enemy does is the enemy comes and lies to us. And it's like, we have problems in our life. We have these little ants that come along. Because how many of you guys know Jesus, or the, the, Jesus obliterated every attack of the enemy on the cross? He did it. He won. He won. And so all of these attacks of the enemy, this stress, this anxiety, this depression, this discouragement comes up like these little ants. And then what the enemy tries to do is the enemy tries to make you shrink in your awareness of yourself to be the size of the ant and think, man, this stress it's going to overtake me. How many of you guys have ever believed that lie before, that if I don't stress out, this thing won't happen, this project won't? Everyone ever believed that before? Because that's what the enemy tries to do. He tries to shrink you to the size of the ant. And then all of a sudden, your problems look big. But what do you do when you're confronted with this stuff? This is the key to living in God's presence, is looking at that thing and just go through it. Get the narrative of God in your life. God, you love me. You're for me. God, you like me. I found favor in your sight. And then it's like you start to grow and you start to remember who you are. And God, you live inside of me. I never have to be alone ever again. You love me. You're for me. The fire of a billion suns burns within me. The God that raised Jesus from the dead burns within me. And all of a sudden you remember that. I mean, on our own, we're weak, but with Christ, we're strong. And in Christ, you get to take that little ant and just boom, throw it into the fire of a billion suns. <laughs> and it's what Jesus, Jesus purchased. Let's just close your eyes, close your eyes. And again, um, if, if the, no one comes to the keys, I'll, I'll, I'll sing. And it'll be scary, but God will come. He loves me. So yeah, just close your eyes. Thank you, Holy Spirit, just for your presence. I just want you, just all the questions, just ask the Lord this question. Just as we end this year, this isn't a message. This isn't necessarily an end of the year message. This is, a, this is, a, this is an all the time message. And, and I think really the key that we, that we, what we want to do is we want to ask the question is, Father, what is the key for me to live in your presence this next year? 
What is the key for me to live in your presence? Just listen, just to that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. And the second thing you can ask him is, just ask him this, just ask him, Father, what is keeping me from living in your presence? Because we just went through the truth. We went through that you were designed to be in God's presence, Genesis 1. We went through um, how much God has done to move towards you, that it's not about anything you can do. It's about the grace of a loving dad who's overcome every obstacle to be with you. And so if there's something out of whack in you, just ask the Father, Father, what's keeping you? It might be shame. It might be a voice of shame that tries and tells you when you mess up that you're not worthy of God's presence. It might be fear. Romans chapter eight, it actually says this. The Bible says we're no longer slaves to fear because we've been adopted as sons and daughters by a father. So that's the key to overcoming fear is realizing that you have a dad that loves you, that's for you. It's Romans eight. So just ask the Lord, Lord, what is it? What is it that's keeping me from living in your presence? So those are the two questions, two questions. So Father, how am I supposed to live in your presence this next year and what is keeping me from living in your presence? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for speaking all across this room.